We are faced with dealing with rules that should be there but just are not there because no one uh, was prepared for this. So, as for technical writers, the usual onboarding process um, goes like this. You enter the workplace, you receive maybe your work laptop or, well, whatever, your computer, right? You assign your uh, user ID and passwords, you enter the infrastructure, and then you get down to learning the way things are for the technical writing department. You know, what I found uh, that helps is to have the separate chat uh, on a different platform. Like if you use Slack, maybe you can use Google Chat or Telegram or different maybe WhatsApp. Because, you know, on a subconscious level, when something arrives in your work chat and you see the notification, you still get this, oh, something, something, yeah. something happened, something broken. Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Today, our guest is Karen Sori who you may have met at one of our API The Docs conferences. She's a technical writer, copywriter, and public speaker from Kiev, Ukraine. She's also a technical writing and data security lead at Women Who Code Kiev organization that helps and educates women in STEM. Back then, you were working for Cossack Labs, which is a British-Ukrainian data security company. And uh, you also gave presentations about spinning up uh, technical writing practices there and what to do, how to do. Uh, last year, Karen became self-employed as a contract technical writer and consultant. And as an additional surprise, today is Karen's birthday. Happy birthday, Karen. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. Laura, thank you, Annette, for having me, for inviting me to the podcast. It's a great honor for me. We're very happy that you're here. We are going to talk of a not strictly technical writing topic, but still it's for technical writers and it's very much a 2020 topic about remote onboarding and how can you solve the onboarding process itself. And I'm very interested in what comes after that. How do you do that remotely? And how did you experience this with the, the multiple clients uh, you have? Yeah, you know, thank you for this question and for mentioning actually um, something that can be scripted technical writing or non-scripted technical writing. You know, very often I tend to question myself, what is a technical writer's job, you know? Uh, because you cannot quite put a finger on it what you're going to do and what you're not going to do because we're dealing with uh, creating texts, instructions, and images, illustrations, right? We do everything from text to videos to instructions. So I don't know, for me, everything is a technical writing topic, uh, to be honest, because- Very much so. Like, yeah, you never know what you're going, what next task you're going to receive, really. As a technical writer, I was shooting videos, I was shooting pictures, I don't know, also taking interviews, so like, I don't know what can be strict technical writing and what just cannot. But yeah, the onboarding process for technical writers uh, is something that, you know, uh, very special when as onboardings go because we expect, we create rules and we create regulations. So basically we expect from ourselves and from our colleagues and especially new colleagues that they are going to show up um, with their set of rules and regulations. But you know, as a quarantine hit us all, Many companies never expected to be remote-centered companies, right? Uh, some companies involved some parts of being uh, remote-based and some companies were just actively opposing being uh, remote-based companies. So now, uh, as technical writers, we need to, we, we are faced with dealing um, with rules that should be there, but just are not there because no one uh, was prepared for this. So as for technical writers, the usual onboarding process um, goes like this. You enter your workplace, you receive maybe your work laptop or well, whatever, your computer, right? You assign your uh, user ID and passwords, you enter the infrastructure, and then you get down to learning the way things are for the technical writing department. You find out about the style guides, about the software. So either that's maybe Madcap Flare, maybe that's Adobe Rubber Help, or, or maybe you're dealing with the doc as code approach and as a GitHub and you work on, on site with developers, right? 
Um, but how it usually goes, you get um, something put down in writing, and then you're told over a cup of coffee that, oh, you know, it's a bit outdated, so let's just you talk to John, talk to Maria, and they will just update you on the way things really are in here. Yeah, and so, go to this room for that password and that room for that password, and you're going to get the USB stick from somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. So that's the first part that's um, obviously missing during this remote onboarding process. You also wrote an article about how to stay productive when working from home in March. And uh, I found it very useful because you included even practical tips on on the technical side, for example, the webcam setups and uh, lighting and also how to keep our sanity. So it was a great art yeah. article. And uh, now six months have passed and I assume you are still working from home. Have something changed since you wrote the article? So do you have further suggestions or best practices you learned in this half last year? Yeah, I'm still working from home. As I said, I'm a fully remote um, technical writing consultant. So, you know, the article held true in March and April, maybe in May. And then, you know, the summer of desperation just hit, you know, when it's summer outside and you're stuck at home and you're so depressed. So anything goes, at least anything went uh, during the summertime. Ice cream, <laughs> new plan. <laughs> Uh, so everyone was going crazy in their own way. Basically, I just, I don't know, I, I started growing plants in my home. <laughs> but oh. apart from that, everything still holds true. Yeah, I never had a green thumb, but I, I realized that adding more plants to my home office just improved my overall sanity. So I decided to go with it. And all of the plants are still alive, which is a surprise. What I would like to add for technical writers who are trying to stay sane at home, like mm, I'd say, keep reading the news, keep reading the industry relevant news outlets because it was really, really easy to you know just let everything slip by because it was really hard for us. But the software was not standing still, and uh, all of our tools have been updated because you know people had more time to actually and more. Uh, um, incentive to dedicate more time to improving the UX of tools. So we should be able to catch up with all of the new things that have been introduced. Like, for example, well, Google Drive, obviously, they have been integrated with Grammarly. And I yeah. find it uh, to be a really nice feature right now. Um, and all of the other tools, they even if we have been stuck in the same mode of thinking, our tools have moved on. So we need to catch up with our tools. Uh, well, beside, um, apart from that, I'd say I'd add that being comfortable is still a very, very important thing. Um, I was suffering uh, in misery because I could not uh, get comfortable shoes to wear at home because I was too afraid to go out and actually shop for shoes. And everything I had at home just <laughs> would not, you know, it seems so, such a minor thing. But when you do not have the shoes to wear when you work, it just gets on your nerves. So, yeah, it's. It's weird things that keep us alive and happy, as it turns out. No, and, and these so-called little things are so important. So, yeah, indeed. Uh, we didn't have a new writer colleague since the pandemic, but I had to work together with new members from other teams. And it is harder. Indeed, from my perspective, I started to prepare documents, which we never had before, for example. Mm -hmm. Because when we worked in the office, we considered those facts like evidences. But in the last six months, I learned that they are not. And I think it is quite challenging because uh, there are a lot of things, for example, in our company that it, it is not written down. But people learn it in their first weeks during working in the office. And now it is all vanished. And uh, we, the technical writer team, have to create those. So these are new, but we now really, really need talks like that. Everything should be written down because now we can get information about specific workflows and best practices when we are, I don't know, we are waiting next to the coffee machine. Mm -hmm. How can you see that? Because you are on the other side as you are joining teams remotely and start working. Are there any challenges or can you tell us about your journey and your findings? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, speaking about guidelines, well, I think I spent my first month uh, and this uh, with this new um, employer writing guidelines for gu guidelines because a lot of things were unsaid. The way things are done and the way things are. And as a newbie, I was trying to, you know, dig through the existing documentation and see how well it, it's con we use Confluence. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, trying to real understand how things work without bothering anyone and it just wasn't possible because some uh, links were missing so i was a person to go to subject matter experts on the way things are and i was writing guidelines on the way we operate a certain software or for for example the company has just moved to adobe rubber help so it was not fully covered how to use it so i had to also study it because it was my first time working with adobe rubber help before that i worked with madcap flare and uh, github wiki so i had to dive deep into the way things are with adobe and dig through their documentation and i was creating uh, the summaries of how our go to uh, goals can be achieved um, within a short period of time how we can structureize our documents and how we move from you know bits and pieces from um, dropbox paper and then google drive and microsoft word documents into proper content creation tool so i was writing guidelines and then as technical writers, we do a lot of testing because when things change in the software interfaces, um, sometimes it's not enough just for the Q&A department to test. We also need to test and approach it, you know, using like, like through the this eyes was, of the uh, user. Got it. These were things you decided that are missing and you wrote them for yourself first for your own learning I, or you agreed that you were with your team that you were the new technical writer who's onboarding and these are missing so you're going to create them like how, how yeah. did it come about and because you joined quite a big group yeah i we decided that i was going to be the guinea pig and i will you know stumble upon all the things that just do not work the way they should work and i just voiced um my concerns and things i wanted to improve during the daily stand-up meetings and we agreed that something should be covered in writing and i would do that yeah <laughs> so, so that you volunteered <laughs> yeah i was the guinea the problem you volunteered to solve it yeah tested not tested on animals but tested on human technical writers <laughs> so i was saying we we also we test um, in the um, user fan space facing interfaces and then we have sets of handbooks how to operate them for the end users and we to recheck them every time before a major release so and when i approached this task i was at a loss because you know it was a totally new interface and no information on how to actually approach the testing not well, we had a procedure how to test, but you could, you didn't know where to get the password, which virtual machine to use, and how to approach it. And we we realized that it was actually a gap because before that, all the technical writers all sat in the same room. So for them, it was yeah. like obvious that you just ask your colleague and they tell you. But when I'm actually I'm the first technical writer who would not be sitting in that room because I'm even in in a different city. Hmm. This is a question for both Anat and Karen, although hmm. I work in the same company as Anat, but I wasn't onboarded, so I wasn't involved in this process. When you start documenting everything, yeah. sooner or later, I do assume that some tidbits of information get written down and circulated that should not be. Or once you put a lot of tidbits of information together, this could become security critical who did you ask to review this it's like not like one tidbit of information can be a problem but maybe there's such a thing as too many sensitive information in one place or this never came up well it really depends on the the type of the document i guess because there are uh, documents i'm kind of i want to proofread them with the developers or in some cases if if uh, it's about sensitive information, the legal team also can help. But personally, I I didn't experience this, what you just said, Laura. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, 
the biggest problem when you really need to document everything is not the fact that you have to document everything, but the maintenance and the the afterlife of the the big documentation pool because documentation rot is a, a serious problem, I guess, in, in every company. Mm. What do you think, Karen? Oh, you know, well, since I have a security background from Closet Labs, like data security and encryption company. So as we joked there, like if you work in security, you, be you become just paranoid and there is no way around it. So that's, uh, and the funniest thing that I, I have security projects that I work on right now, but not Closet Labs. And the security projects usually tend to be open source. So everything is out in the open and you worry more about the user infrastructure. Well, with, um, you know, with telecom billing software, there are a lot of pieces that are customer facing. So we segment things by having separate spaces uh, in Confluence like something that's strictly internal, something that's strictly external for the customers and, and users of those customers. But the funny thing is that I spent a few days, the first days uh, there, like writing frantic emails to the technical and security department, like, are you sure this can be out in the open? Oh, I found um, this and this. Are you sure this can be facing the um, client? Mm -hmm. And here I see some, you know, settings for uh, some hardware, can it be in the open? Is it secure? So yeah, um, nothing bothered me as for internal documentation. We just put in, you know, whatever in there because it's internal and we have really strict several factor authorization. It's all tied to, you know, the uh, office uh, infrastructure and you need to, to have the two factor authorization. So it's pretty secure. As I said, I'm, I'm paranoid after working at the security company. So nothing is 100% secure ever but i'm pretty happy with the way security is built um, but you need to pay attention to what you put out in, in there in the open for you know your clients or potential clients to read indeed mm -hmm. and who whom did you have what role in the companies in the separate companies did you ask to check this with uh, well usually there is some security department or at least um no i you know I tend to approach the HR department because you know everyone who's who does who does what everywhere. So the HR department um, directed me uh, in the way where whom I could speak with about the security and about the security concerns that I had. But thankfully, all of my security concerns were just that concern. So everything was cool and secure. But as for uh, you know a newbie, it was really mm, mm, looking suspicious to me. <laughs> I did not know that it could be really facing the end user and it was secure because, you know, you couldn't do any damage from implementing that information you found out in the open. Right, let's hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What if um, the things that is not necessarily technical writing specific, but onboarding specific really, is that even if we write everything down, so we help the person to be onboarded and they find, let's hope in an ideal situation, they find all the information they need to do their job. But then the rest of the team has to sort of monitor and evaluate the progress of this person. One aspect of that is cultural integration, really. And the other is how are the skills developing? And when you're working from home, there's a lot of distractions. So it's very, very hard to really see what's going on with the person. And a lot of the meta communication falls away, even if you have the video come on. How do you solve that? Well, um, did you have to onboard somebody else already? No, I haven't, but I approach everything from the point of, you know, I'm not the last technical writer hiring here. So we're going to have newbies. So let's, if we stumble upon something, let's put it in writing right now and let's, put it down because we are going to forget when a new person arrives i'm not going to be in newbie anymore and we will mm -hmm. forget to inform the person and to update them on the way it should be done mm -hmm. as for you know meta communication being lost i think what's uh, being developed right now for everyone like it's not only for technical writers it's for everyone working remotely these days is a different level of meta communication you know you using emojis smileys 
some mem pictures. I don't know. Here in the um, in, in this part of the world, we had this really huge popular mem about, hey, Natalie, wake up like four cats staring at you uh, from above uh, into the camera and it's, it goes just hey natalie wake up we're cats and we just destroyed everything so this hey wake up natalie we destroyed everything uh, was a mem that accompanied news every day we just so we had this informal chat for um our office and just every morning would start and and the name of one of our hrs is natalie so every morning we just post a new mem with this cat like hey natalie the cat destroyed something else something new and this you know this small connection over some silly picture of four cats staring at you it's that level of meta that can bring you together in a different way yeah it's not non-verbal communication it's different communication but it still allows you to you know how those small gestures that let you know that hey we're all human here we're all afraid of what the world is going to bring us in 2020 and beyond and here i share with you the silly thing for you to smile and for us to for it to bring us together over some you know like virtual cup of coffee something like that yeah i can Oh, sorry. I, can totally, I can totally feel that uh, we have a technical writing team of three and uh, back in uh, before the COVID we, we work together in the same office every day so it, it's a really strange situation for us and we yeah we have some kind of anxiety because of the lack of connection so we started uh, as you mentioned uh, just sharing silly pictures and uh, there is this new thing uh, between the three of us that we start uh, with our day sharing um, a music track and yeah and these are more important and uh, it's strange because um, five months uh, before uh, I felt that meetings are distracting and and yeah it's something you sometimes want to avoid but now i think they are more important and it, it is important to accommodate time for not just work related calls as well because in the office we have this five minute chit chats and if if you don't have these in a regular work day then it's it's not good for mental health i think yeah you know what i found um, that helps is to have the separate chat uh, on a different platform like mm -hmm. if you use Slack, maybe you can use Google Chat or Telegram or a different maybe WhatsApp. Because, you know, on a subconscious level, when something arrives in your work chat and you see the notification, you still get this, oh, something, something, yeah. something happened. Something's broken. You need to you need get to something done. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. That it, a new notification in a safe chat. So... It, it's kind of i really recommend that so yeah currently and, well in casa club when I, I know that they implemented they use discord for informal informal audio meetings they have like water cooler mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh, well, right now with my main team my main employer uh, we have a separate chat in telegram and you know they have animated stickers in this messenger and it's really really cool you can really customize you can even create your own packs of stickers so you can customize the communication a lot and that brings everyone um, up to the same you know meta level of memes and funny cat pictures and i know the different uh, other teams just have um, slack uh, meetings and where they just have informal business on slack and that's all right for them and if one of your colleagues is assume on multiple projects and say it's a junior colleague just onboarded, did you, did you set in place new methods for reporting or tracking to see if the person is just very simply busy with other priorities or are they struggling with something? Well, we have, um, again, quarantine, um, 
pushed us in the direction of implementing guidelines on how to approach most of the writing tests because, as I said, uh, multiple writers are involved, multiple writers, editors and proofreaders. So we have guidelines on how to, you know, go over each step and if something is uh, missing or something's wrong, um, the rule of thumb is you just approach your colleague uh, on Slack. But we also have a task tracking um, service. Uh, you, we use you track here. So uh, on you track, if something is wrong, you can also ping your colleague, tag them, and ask for help if something is wrong. So yeah, you just uh, oh tag someone in an issue there, and you ask for help. Sometimes, mm -hmm. especially when you deal with, you know, it's a popular pain for all the technical writers when you need to get a hold of your subject matter expert and they are nowhere to be found, you text them everywhere, you email them, you call them and sometimes you still have to wait. But that's happened to me everywhere whenever I work because, yeah. Is it different since everyone's remote? No. It's still hard to get hold of everyone. <laughs> but now you can't even bring chocolate to the office. So how do you? <laughs> how do you yeah. Do but no, it, it was no different uh, even at the, at the office because still developers are usually very, very busy on their tasks with, that require tunnel vision. And I'm very respectful of that. But it's still very hard, you know, when the tasks just collide because the person needs to finish developing something. and usually i need to have my documentation ready by the very same date but mm -hmm. as i said i think that just um, that every every technical right we just faces that's the nature of our work we need to find those nooks and crannies of time when we can speak to people who know the way things really work and we need to describe that yeah i do agree that finding subject matter experts are even harder now that we are not in the same office and i just can't approach them and sometimes you know it's it's so frustrating when people tell you that you need to approach this person because they are the expert in this matter and you spend about a week trying to get a hold of them and they they tell you oh no no you should have talked to another person <laughs> and here's another yeah. week gone also that's that's pretty typical everywhere i <laughs> so, feel the pain yeah so yeah and, and speaking about you know like trying to compare this technical writing being in the office and remotely. Sometimes uh, I really miss the, you know, the opportunity to look over the shoulder of the subject matter expert and to see how it works in their infrastructure, infrastructure and when it works on their machine, because that would be a major security red flag to um, ask for remote access to developers uh, workstation. But you could do that totally when you're at the office. You just go and stand in there and you can see the way things work when they are really, really raw. You know, they just basically show you the open heart surgery that you see this bit of code kind of works here and it's going to work like this and there. And you're going to describe it like this because it's going to work differently in a week from now. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the thing that's probably missing. Um, as, as my last question. How do you see the technical writer's role now in the time of remote working? Is it transforming? Because I already mentioned that there are, for example, new type of documents I have to write, but I, I haven't before. How do you see this? Yeah, it's transforming because now we are the people um, that people look up to and go for to create guidelines for guidelines on guidelines in different departments because it's easier for us maybe because we already know how to structure procedures and it's easier for us to create uh, guidelines for ourselves and different departments they understand and they realize something is missing and they need their procedures also to be described to other newbies and other teams and they do not how to approach it and sometimes you uh they just ask you to write it and it's easier but sometimes you face uh documents and they try to create themselves and it's actually it's often so funny and wordy and for the structure so you just okay okay folks i'll just going to take an hour and i get back to them with uh, something that really you know reflects what they were trying to say and they're so very grateful and those are the moments when i realize hey is my work really matters because you know as technical writers we also often face this thing like no one reads the docs 
I'll read the docs when everything breaks down. I'll only read the docs if I need to implement a super, super complicated API, and that's it. But here we can immediately see the value of our, our work when we can help structureize the workplace mm, guidelines. And you know, during the quarantine, it remi reminds me of the way they plant, uh, they create uh, uh, roads in parks. You know, in really good parks, they first just plant trees and grass and they see where people walk and they create the road where people walk, not where the road was supposed to be. And that's more ergonomic ways. So we also need to create, you know, not just procedures for people to stick to, but we need to kind of weave the existing practices into a guideline that would be really useful, not just something strict that should be adhered to like one, two, three, and you cannot just go left or right from it. You to choose your own adventure version of the menu. I wonder yeah. if what you said to help other other departments create structured and discoverable docs, if the role of tech writers isn't even greater because you create such documents with a future vision of this needs to be maintained. So when it's not a wall of text, but a well-structured, uh, meta-tagged, very discoverable pieces, standalone mm -hmm. pieces, then it's then you as the tech writer can also provide the tools and the methods with which you can actually keep this up to date because it's great if somebody spent a document off on every single process but if they have to update that next year and they don't know how to keep that updated then that's a problem and i think that's where tech writers absolutely shine yeah yeah and also you reminded me about one thing that thinking about cross-department communication so I, I realized uh, the current project that there was very little communication between the tech marketing and tech documentation writing departments. So, and, and we created, we merged into one single Slack channel together and we're so happy because we can finally communicate and you know be on the same page with all the naming so we got this marketing information and they got more technical information and it's so cool that you can finally share it I, I, do, I honestly don't know how they live without this cross-department communication when separate writers were in you know separate uh, virtual spaces even and now the communication makes everything easier and it's easier to update these guidelines as you said so now it's not going to be updated next year it's going to be updated the moment someone realizes that something is off or does not work well karen do you want to reiterate the message you want to leave the listener with yeah create the road to where you want to go not with your documentation not where you're supposed to go now let me rephrase that like I'd say, actually, create a path between your desired outcome and where you are right now, and actually put in the stones in that path that make um, the process comprehensible and useful. Do not just put it in there for it to be in there. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. You can reach us at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidedocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past presentations from the API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.